<clears throat> so SmackDown won, and here's why. Raw begins with Baron Corbin, Bobby Lashley, and Drew McIntyre in the ring. This is the new uh, baddie stable du jour on Raw. Quick question, where's Dolph Ziggler in all this? Did he and Drew break up and I just didn't know about it, didn't hear about it, or forgot about it? You know, these two have been hanging with each other for months now, and now there's this new uh, heel group fronted by Baron Corbin, the authority figure, and Dolph's not part of this group? I know that they like to have groups of three, whether they're face or heels, all the time on the company, but you think putting Dolph in here would make some sense. I guess Leo Rush doesn't count breaking the three-man pattern because he's like so small, it's like three and a half. I don't know. Anyway, they put over the fact that they put Braun Strowman on the shelf. They cut to this pre-taped interview with Strowman, uh, pre-surgery, saying he'd rather be in Milwaukee. I believe it's the first time anyone's ever said that sentence. Corbin talks some more on the mic before the lights cut out, and uh, Elias shows up on stage to interrupt them. He sings a song about how Bobby Lashley sucks before he just stops what he's doing dead in his tracks to make his way to the ring before commercial break. Uh, I feel it'd be so much stronger if Elias kind of changed up the format of his promos, especially uh, in, in cases like this, and ended his promo with, and WWE stands for Walk With Elias, that sort of thing. I feel it's such a stronger way to end on a catchphrase like that than instead of just doing a song and stopping cold in the middle of what you're doing to go to the ring. That, to me, can end on a weak note. Anyway, Bobby Lashley versus Elias. Apparently, I haven't seen that match enough lately. Leo Rush pulls the referee out after Elias at the elbow drop, and the referee DQs Lashley on account of that, but then Corbin says, no, 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 it's no DQs. Then all of a sudden, all the three heels beat down on uh, Elias. They stand tall, and they seem to be sticking with this new title that Corbin gave himself in the promo of General Manager Elect. They're going with that now. Boy, in a few months' time, Baron Corbin's gone from the constable to the acting general manager to general manager elect. What a career trajectory for this man. Backstage, Baron Corbin makes Alexa Bliss the new overseer of the women's division, because that's what this show needs. More heel authority figures. Mwah, I love it. Uh, this is basically an official promotion for her while she's still on the shelf for an unknown amount of time with her injuries, I feel now is a really good time to maybe do kind of a, a non-seasonal call-up of an NXT female. Bring one or two up to the main roster now instead of having to wait until the Raw and SmackDown after Mania to do it. Uh, because now with, you know, with one fewer woman competing on Raw and with the Raw Women's Division as stale as it is at the moment, I feel uh, getting some new blood into that division would help things in that regard. Also, the, the announcers made this huge deal all night. Oh my God, Alexa Bliss is an active competitor and she's an authority figure. Like, for the last four or five months, Baron Corbin's been an active, active competitor, and he's the friggin' general manager-elect now, so what's the difference? We get a bizarre Dean Ambrose promo where he gets all the vaccinations, including one in his ass cheek, and, you know, he's just basically doing everyone, like, he's doing a PSA for people, telling people to take care of themselves and get vaccinated. I think you should space them out, though, a little bit more than what you were doing. That's just my opinion. Uh, it's, it's a very weird promo. Also, I hate the fact that they're trying to build up the fact that he's in a different place, like, He's not in the same building as everyone else. Like, look, it's lit and shot the exact same way as everything else you do in this programming. So who are you trying to fool? And it's time for another segment of, hey, guys, let's ask what Renee Young thinks about all this. And it's just more of this cringeworthy stuff where it's so weird because they keep going to her every time they that Dean Ambrose does something on the show. Oh, what's your take on this? You know, but they never explicitly say, they have yet to ever say the fact that uh, Renee and Dean are, you know, wife and husband. They're not saying they're married. There's, you know this person. What's the deal? And Renee was like the dumbest line of the night saying, I live with a guy. I don't know everything he does. Yeah, I, I can't read the cues and I can't figure out what's going on with this man I've decided to spend the rest of my life with, okay? Get off my back. Well, the Revival are idiots and want to rematch with all three members of the Lucha House party under Lucha House rules because at least now they'll be prepared when they're at disadvantage and they lose again. What a shock. Nia Jax still embracing the heat that she's got from injuring Becky Lynch a few weeks ago, and she shows not one but two video packages in her promo. People say this is a really bad promo by Nia Jax, but, you know, I don't think it was that bad. It wasn't good. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I don't think it was a great promo, but I don't think it was as bad as everyone says it was. I think she's just owning her character. She's owning this position of being the one to injure Becky Lynch, and she's just kind of working with it. Again, no, 
not a great promo, but not as bad as everyone says it was. Then Ronda Rousey interrupts. It looks like she has pink eye in both of her eyes. Like she's had some jarring makeup in the past few months, but whatever she had going on this week was just, it was the worst. She should fire her makeup artist stat. Uh, they have a face off after Nia Jax says she's stalling for time. I don't know if that was like kind of a wink nudge thing to the, the producers in the back or what. That was a really weird line. Anyway, they have a face off. Natalia shows up to try and even the odds. She gets shit canned by the Riot Squad. Uh, Rousey beats all three of them up single handedly. They leave, and that's where the whole thing ends. And eh, this was just a, a really weird promo, uh, just all around. They were trying to cram all these different, like, whatever storylines they got going on with the women all into one segment, and I don't think it worked. We get a rematch between AOP and Ruble. This time, Drake Maverick grabs uh, Bobby Roode's vest, takes it to the back, and pisses on it. You know what? I might be the only person on Earth who actually enjoyed this bit because, good, you know, finally, a uh, one win for the managers. All right, he's finally standing up for himself. He's taking ownership of this whole P thing, and he's, he's getting revenge on one of the guys who made fun of him. Like, And also, AOP wins, which is a nice change of pace. And so I think this is actually my favorite part of the whole show was Drake Maverick pissing on Bobby Roode's robe. There you go. Up next, we get Ember Moon with Kurt Hawkins versus Alicia Fox with Jinder Mahal. It's the latest, and they're kind of hyping up the Mixed Match Challenge. And apparently now Kurt Hawkins has replaced Braun Strowman as Ember's partner in the Mixed Match Challenge. And Ember was the replacement for Alexa Bliss before she got hurt. And so now that's what the team has morphed into is Kurt Hawkins and Ember Moon. Boy, the injury bug's been biting a lot in the company lately, it seems. Uh, Ember hits the Eclipse for the win, and Kurt is psyched. And I was thinking at this point that you'd have the guys fight you know you'd have Kurt versus Jinder but then No Way Jose comes out and we have Jinder versus Jose all right and so then Jinder beats No Way Jose and that's great to see Jinder win a match but why do they have to protect Kurt Hawkins for this Seth Rollins has got his Intercontinental Championship Open Challenge match, and who accepts it but Dolph Ziggler? Well, that's not the absolute safest pick they could have gone with here. Look, I mean, this match was fine. Both guys are great. I'm not going to discount that, but we've seen these two wrestle each other a hundred times on television and pay-per-view in the last six months alone. Could Seth wrestle anyone else on the roster? Is that at all possible? Uh, Seth wins with the Superplex into Dragon Arrow combo. That's what he wins with. I don't think it's ever happened before in a Seth Rollins match. So the first move by New women's division overseer Alexa Bliss is to have Sasha Banks and Bailey in the ring to chat it out in an open forum where fans will ask questions and then they answer them and woohoo my nipples explode with delight just thinking about this uh they uh, respond to the first the only person the only fan who asks the question is this random girl in the front row who asks what would you do to improve the women's division now I know on social media Sasha and Bailey teased something about the women's tag team championships that everyone wants and instead of talking Talking about that, they just use it as, as an excuse to talk trash to Alexa Bliss, and then Alexa shoots back in kind, and then all of a sudden, out come Mickey James and Dana Brooke to jump Sasha and Bailey, and the heels get thwarted, and that was it. What a god awful waste of time this was. Why? If you're gonna do a heel beatdown, what's the point of this stupid forum thing where you only have one question asked? It's a terrible answer, and then you, this is all bad. Main event time as Finn Balor takes on Baron Corbin. Wowzers, we've never seen that match before on television. Uh, we come out of commercial break mid match, and we see just a second of the old reliable hold, that head and arm hold that Baron does so well before uh, Finn fights out of it. We get a full length match between these two guys before Baron gets on the mic and says, Actually, it's a handicap match. Here's my partner, Drew McIntyre. He comes in, beats Finn, one, two, three, the heels win, and then he Lashley joins in, and they all beat down Finn, and that's that's great. That's how the show ends. You know, this is something I'm going to talk about a little bit in my uh, classic review of Backlash 2001 later this week, but, you know, the whole thing of Baron changing the rules on the fly, which he's done in the last couple weeks as well, like, if that's what you're going to do, why don't, why do you wait till the very end of a match to do that? Why don't you just say from the beginning, oh, by the way, I'm going to dick you over? Like, what's the, mm, I, it just seems so silly to me you would take all this time and possibly be humiliated before changing the rules on the fly. I don't mind like evenings. I don't mind shows where like the heels dominate the whole thing and they stand tall at the beginning and the end. Like that's fine because eventually you get that kind of like heat, that, that baby face comeback. But like 
who's going to fight him? Who's going to fight this contingent of heels run by Baron Corbin? Like, as you know, Braun's hurt. He's not going to be back for a while. Finn is booked so inconsistently, even if he came back and just beat the shit out of all three of them, it wouldn't be believable. Elias is, you know, he's okay, but you would kind of, he couldn't do it by himself. You need him and Finn, and Finn's, mm. and then you've got, you know, Seth Rollins is tied up with Dean Ambrose. Roman Reigns ain't coming back for a long time. So who do you get? What are they going to do here? How much longer is this authority bullshit going to go this retread this tired ass retread of an authority angle coming back how long is it going to go before somebody rises up and challenges them in a matchup that would at least be exciting to see i mean man what a terrible episode of raw this was i am joining the cacophony of people who say this is you know the worst of the year i thought last week's raw was bad but this one managed to top it by doing all the same shit they did last week, but doing it worse and doing it over and over again. I just, it was just so frustrating. It was so boring. It was so just meh. You know, honestly, I hope that this is a case of WWE just not trying. I hope this is a case of them just actively going, you know what? We're gonna phone this one in. We're gonna count our money, rest on our laurels, and not give a shit about this one. Because I would hate to imagine that this show was a result of them actually trying. SmackDown begins with the return of Becky Lynch, back on SmackDown for the first time since before Survivor Series. So like, was it two weeks? I mean, that wasn't a very long break. I've seen longer hiatuses from other champions on this roster. Shinsuke Nakamura ring any bells? Uh, anyway, she calls out Charlotte. Uh, the two exchange some bombs. They actually acknowledge the fact that it seems that Charlotte just kind of usurped Becky's aura and her badassery in the last week or so from Survivor Series and the SmackDown afterward. Paige makes a match between the two of them at TLC in a TLC match for the SmackDown Women's Championship, and then out come the rest of the ladies eventually to say that they want a shot as well. So Paige makes a match, a battle royal between all those ladies later in the night, and the winner of that match will be added to the TLC match at TLC. Who could it be? First match of the night is the Usos taking on the bar in non-title action, and Cesaro and Sheamus are about 450 pounds lighter because the Big Show is no longer with them. They show this backstage bit from earlier in the day where the Big Show punches Cesaro in the mush after they berate him for what happened last week in the turkey fight, whatever, with the New Day. And so that was a fun couple of weeks. The Big Show was there. And now he's not there anymore. Uh, the match between the Usos and the Bar, it was a very good match. The Usos win. I wish that, you know, the SmackDown Tag Team Champions wouldn't keep losing all the time. That's just me. After a great backstage bit between The Miz and The New Day, where it's revealed that Big E might be a closeted Mariner, AKA fan of the Marine series, and I feel you on that one, man, we get a fiery AJ Styles promo in the ring where he basically challenges Daniel Bryan to a rematch for the championship at TLC. It was a good promo, but I wish we saw Daniel Bryan here on Tuesday. After that great promo he had where he explained all his actions and everything, I wanna see more of the new Daniel Brian, and we got none of that short of the highlight package from last week that they showed that was kind of a downer for me we're supposed to have a match between Shinsuke Nakamura and Rusev but the match never happens uh, Shinsuke beats up Rusev before the match officially begins hits him with two keen shots and walks away and poses on the stage that was kind of disappointing because I mean it's, it's already bad enough we don't see a lot of these guys on TV at all as of late and this is all we get of them like I'm sure this is going to build to more stuff down the line but I feel we can get to we can get to that point without doing this whole kind of bait and switch thing. Time now to celebrate Jeff Hardy's 20th anniversary of, well, they kind of go back and forth on that because sometimes they say it's the 20th anniversary of him signing with the company for the first time. Other times they say it's the 20th anniversary of him as a WWE superstar, which is completely untrue. Uh, the whole roster is on the stage and Michael Cole introduces Jeff to the ring and introduces the video package. Very nice high package to show a lot of the crazy stuff Jeff has done over the last 20 years. Hardy has a heartfelt speech, then Smojo interrupts. He takes a couple of shots at Jeff for his past history with substance abuse. He says that, you know, you get all these second chances, and guys like me, we never even get our first chance, he said while wearing two of the largest knee braces I've ever seen in my life. Like, I love the guy, but he gets hurt so much, no wonder he doesn't get first chances. Jeff challenges Joe to a match right then and there, but then Joe balks, walks away, and that's it. You know, this is how you do, like, a heel promo that does some edgy stuff about somebody's personal life and it's relevant to the situation it's not like dean ambrose name dropping roman reigns leukemia last week and 
and like Roman has nothing to do with it now. Uh, you know, this I think was done much better. In a follow-up to the backstage bit from earlier, we have The Miz versus Kofi Kingston. This is an entertaining match as well. At one point, The Miz removes the turnbuckle pad, and then Big E produces a giant stack of pancakes as a replacement. Xavier thwarts a chair shot attempt by The Miz, and that allows Kofi to hit the Trouble in Paradise to win the match, and uh, that was that. Randy Orton comes out holding Rey Mysterio's torn mask in his hand as trophy from last week. He wanted to explain his actions from last week, where he says he didn't mean or intend to disparage Lucha Libre and that culture by doing what he did. He just wanted to embarrass Rey Mysterio and make him just another victim, Cole. And all of a sudden, out comes Rey Mysterio with a neck brace, selling the injuries from the chair spot last week. They fight for a little bit. Randy Orton removes the neck brace. They fight some more. Then Orton gets the advantage, drives Rey's neck uh, into the top of the steel chair and uh, lays him out again. Tries to unmask him again, but uh, Adam Pearce saves the day and keeps him from doing that. It's more good build between these two leading up to their eventual blow -off. I'm sure they're going to have some fantastic gimmick match at TLC or something, but I did enjoy at the end of the segment you hear a faint Randy chant after he just tried to murder Mysterio for the second week in a row. Backstage, The Miz confronts Shane McMahon about their future as a team and they have to work together. Miz cannot will this team into existence. Shane has to work with him. My favorite part of this is the very beginning because you see Shane on his phone next to the, the World Cup trophy, you can see Miz's reflection in the trophy as he's getting ready for his cue because they, they wait a couple of beats before he walks into the shot. You see him standing there and you see him walk in. Watch that promo again. You'll see what I mean. It's very entertaining. Main event time, the Women's Battle Royal where the winner gets added to the TLC match for the SmackDown Women's title. The final two come down to Sonya Deville and Asuka. Asuka wins and looky there, from months of obscurity, suddenly she finds herself in the title picture once again. Uh, time will tell what happens with that, but it's quite a big turnaround from this past summer. Well, I already told you at the top of this video which show was winning for the week. It's SmackDown. No question as to why. Raw was simply abysmal. One of the worst, if not the worst, episode of Raw I've seen. Not just this year, but I'm going to go one step further and say one of the worst Raws of the last couple of years. Last few years, as a matter of fact. It was a dreadful show. Literally, the only thing I liked about that show, and I might be in the minority when I say it, is Drake Maverick's revenge when he pees on Bobby Roode's robe. There you go, man. Score one for the managers. I'm behind you all the way, brother. But everything else about that show was just the drizzling shits. Even like the good stuff of like Seth versus Dolph. Great match, but we've seen it a million times before already. Give us something new. That's all I ask, is to give us some new, fresh things. Don't give us an authority figure rehash, especially with, you know, no end in sight with the, who the, who the hell's going to take these guys on? It just makes no sense. I've already gone into detail why I didn't like that show, but here's what I liked about SmackDown. Here's the thing. SmackDown was not an amazing show like on its own, but compared to Raw, it was great. At least SmackDown, for all the problems that I had with it, at least there were like entertaining matches, matches I hadn't seen before or not in a while in angles and storylines where I want to see where they go from here. Raw, I have no interest in seeing what the hell's going on from week to week because we're seeing from week there's no progress. There's no evolution, but no pun intended. Let me know what you thought about Raw and SmackDown this week in the comments section below and be sure to vote which show you thought was better in the gimmick in the upper right hand corner of your screen. I have a pretty good feeling what the ratio that's going to be. Next week, I'm going to do something a little different on Wednesday. I've decided after this week that I'm just going to, you know, my, my trust has been violated by WWE, so I'm not going to watch Raw and SmackDown next week. I'm just not going to take any part in it. I'm just going to I'm going to take a break, a, a one-week sabbatical from Raw and SmackDown just to see how I feel at the end of it. Uh, but for Wednesday, what will I put in its place? Well, I think I'm going to review a show that happened very recently that I've been wanting to watch and review for this channel uh, for days now. I haven't had the time to do it, but next week I finally will. GCW presents Joey Janela's LA Confidential. If you've heard anything about this show on social media, you know there was a lot of shit going down with this. In particular, a certain death match between a certain former WCW champion and Nick Gage. And I really want to watch this show and tell you what I think about it. So that's what's going to happen next week. Next Wednesday, know who wore it better, but I'm going to be reviewing LA Confidential. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.